Hi, and welcome to YeFit Adventures. My name is Darren, and this channel is about backpacking, historical society, and finding your next adventure. In today's video, we are here at the Chinese Laundry to check out the new exhibit after the grand opening about two years ago. So come check it out. <laughs> Laundry Building. Restoration of the Chinese Laundry Building funded by Franklin Yi and Sandra Wang Yi and descendants of the Hogan and Ruth Wong. Wawona residents since 1953. <laughs> Chinese chops. about the pilgrimage on Sunday's board, but it's as a result of the pilgrimages that started in 2013 that through one of the tours that we took here in Momona, this building, um, that we put in a grant to have it restored back to its original purpose. So this building was actually built as a Chinese laundry for the Wawona Hotel, which is just upslope of here. And there was a smaller Chinese laundry, but because it was so successful, we needed to build a bigger laundry. And so this was built in 1917, and it was in operation starting in 1918. Then uh, over time, they discontinued using the laundry. Um, the Chinese that were working, about 20 Chinese worked for the Wuhan Hotel, and about four or five worked in this laundry, um, changed hands, became part of the Yosemite Concert Curry Company, Curry Park Company, in 1932. In 1933, there was 32 a transition, and by 1933, they completely fired all of their Chinese staff that was here for the Washburn family and hired brand new staff. So that was the end of the Chinese who worked here for many, many decades. Um, and then this became a carriage repair shop. So you can see they actually did some changes to Lombi. I don't think some of those were to hoist the carriages. There's that concrete slab, which is so that um, carriages can be brought in through these barn doors, but the original Chinese laundry didn't have these giant doors. Mm. Um, so there have been some changes from the original Chinese laundry to being a carriage repair shop. And there was um, right next door, and there's a picture of it, the place where it was called the boiler, boiler room. And that was where the logs were stacked. It's where they were probably like getting all the hot water for the laundry. Um, and then this place became a giant storage shed. If you're here in one of the early pilgrimages, I'm not sure if anyone here remembers, it was stuffed. You could barely walk in here. There was old carriages over there. There were like these tree stumps that had old carvings. There was machinery, and there was tons of dust and tons of scat from mice <laughs> everywhere. It was just filthy. You didn't even want to breathe coming in here. It was just um, unused. And that's what we saw during the pilgrimage. And then. As a result, we decided to restore this. And with the family that lives down the road, Darren's family, his auntie and uncle, they had a house in Wawona, and they were approached by the Assembly Conservancy, which does a lot of projects to support the park. And they donated the money to have this building restored and to have some of these exhibits made. There was another family called the Fongs um, who 
were able to give some more money the following year, and we were able to put some of these displays and got donations from people like Rob and Young, who donated several walks and irons. Other people that are not here who had things in their in their backyard in their garages, and that's how we were able to put some of these historic objects. So that's just the background history, and I'm just excited that we have a special artist and his um, friend who's like a great musician, and they're both going to do something for the first time. They're going to demonstrate calligraphy and play music, and I just want Lily to introduce them. And um, I just want to say also briefly, Topher Delaney, who's um, a wonderful artist and landscape architect, incredible yeah. work. She introduced me to Lily Dang, who um, brought this artist here. So I want you to introduce the artist. Well, also, yeah. I might say before, I met Yen Yen uh, through a podcast that we do. And Calvin Shin, who is my partner somewhere here. Uh, oh, there he is. Uh, so uh, together we do a podcast called Garden the Knowledge. And we interviewed Yen Yen at some length. And it was a wonderful interview. I was very interested in her work and her background and her service to the national parks. And I wanted to highlight that. And so to listen to it, it, it's a good interview, I think. And Yen Yen listened to it, and she she gave us the okay. And uh, it's it's a very it's her history and how she came to this position here. So there you go, Garden and Knowledge. Thank you. Having us here, um, Lily, and I'm the general secretary from Chinese Art Association from San Francisco Bay Area, and it's an association, nonprofit organization. It's almost for 45 years. We consist of like almost 100 great artists in different format, different styles, and everything. And uh, by knowing Yan Yan through the podcast, I'm actually the follower from Topher. It was amazing that how she used 10 years journey, slowly putting this together. Everybody knew stuff like that with the national parks and you know, like the government officials, it's not easy. So we're taking baby steps, step one step at a time. That's why immediately I will agree to Topher. I said, yeah, we're gonna be down there to support her. You know, with the actual, you know, they in, in later on she's gonna go more detail with the histories and the, talk about anything with the chop carving and also the calligraphy. And uh, right now we're just gonna do the brief demonstration. And Jack Chan he, and his partner Fang Yi, they're the best in the Bay Area, and he's the number one person in U.S. for Minnan style art style. And he's not only good at the painting. He's also good at calligraphy and chop making. It's very rare to have people in all three aspects can handle them all, and then you guys can see it with your own hand with that that number skill of painting. You have to be really good. You know, you have to know like a master style to 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 pull it through. So yeah, and Jack Chan and uh, Fang Yi, I appreciate you guys, you know, actually they're couples and they, this is the first time they worked to get, get together to form a little program for Yan Yan. And the, the title is The High Mountain with the Waterfall. And she's gonna play the background music, which is very famous in chi China. It's like Gao San Liu Sui. And then he's gonna actually do the calligraphy, the forward high mountains and the waterfalls. For the demonstration. I appreciate you guys.
character are indicating the high mountain with the waterfalls. On the side is title and the time and year and uh, your signature at the bottom. And uh, mm -hmm. calligraphy, like art form like this, have, the artist will put their personal chalk. Like he had two, one with the name on it, and then one is like a freestyle, like whatever his favorite and quotes or something. So they put two. So this is like a complete piece. This gives a little bit of the history that I talked about, but I want us to sort of go back into time and it was about 175 years ago. That was 1848. So 1848 is a significant date. Why is 1848 in this country's history significant? Discovery of gold rush? Gold rush. Yeah, it was the discovery of gold on the American River just north of us. And that spread across the world, bringing people from all over, from, from Russia, China, Mexico, Latin America, Europe, all places that heard about this started coming here and it started the gold rush, which is known as the 1849 gold rush. So 1848 was the discovery, 1849 was the gold rush. And it was a rush. By 1850, it wasn't that easy to become wealthy. You really had to get here early. So the Chinese, um, we heard about this place called California Thumb Sun, which means gold mountain often we're talking about some song. So I want to sing this song, and I haven't been singing for years. <laughs> but I figure with the music, yeah. I just know my voice will crack. <laughs> there's this song I looked up the lyrics to, and even though it's not from China, it really does, I think, give a feeling of what it was like for those people that came from other parts of the world, and the families said goodbye to these people that traveled across the ocean or across the land. And it's called Sen Senya Song. Take the wave now and know that you're free. Turn your back on the land kids can't see. Face the wind now so wild and so strong. When you think of me, wave to me and send me a song. Don't look back when you've reached the new shore. Don't forget what you're leaving home for. Don't forget when you're missing me so. Love must never hold, never hold tight, but let go. Oh, the nights will be long when I'm not in your arms, but I'll be in the song that you sing to me across the sea. Somehow, someday, you will be far away, so far from me. And maybe one day, I will follow you with all you do. Till then, send me Song. Mm -hmm. No. Um, it's an Irish song. First time I heard you song. sing it too. I've been here many, many times. It's an Irish song, um, and of course in Ireland there are so many people that came here. Oh yeah. And the Irish have, have beautiful poetry and writings, and the Chinese also have lots of songs. They're called songs of gold fountain that were letters written back and forth, and that song really sort of is similar to so many of the songs of Gold Mountain. So this is an, a little excerpt from one of the songs of Gold Mountain letters that was translated. So this letter said, my husband, pressed by poverty, took off to Gold Mountain. With a petty sum of money, he cannot make the journey home. The road to Gold Mountain is extremely perilous and difficult. At home in grief and pain, my longing eyes pierce through the horizon, waiting for his return. <coughs> Is there any kind of feeling that you get from that song that you can just feel of what it was like for these people that came across the ocean, traveled far from all over the world? What was it like for them? What was it like to be here, often not speaking the language? What was it like for them to, to get a job? What do you think they were feeling? Anyone want to just share? If you were one of these Gold Mountain men arriving here, what are some of the thoughts? 
feeling that you might have. Scared? Yeah. Anxiety. Anxiety, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what was great about the people that did come from China, there were groups here that were formed. Um, the six companies is the name because there were six regions in China. I wish we had a map, we can take a map of the six areas from the Guangzhou province area. And they each had their own special dialect too. So these companies, when the Chinese <coughs> arrived, would help them find work, mm. help them come you know, with groups of people that they can talk with and brought them to the mining towns and basically gave them that like at least foundation when they got here. A lot of these Chinese were indebted because it cost so much money to travel across the ocean and so they had to pay that back. And that made it really a high pressure situation. They had to be able to make money so they can bring that money back to their families. The reason why they came was there was a lot of social famine and droughts and political unrest. This is the time of the Opium Wars, the time of the Taiping Rebellion. Um, there was, because of the environmental disasters, a lot of the people that worked on the farms were having a difficulty providing food. And that's what was the push for a lot of the Chinese that came to Gold Mountain. So by 1851, approximately 25,000 Chinese came over here. But there was something that made their life really hard. And it was not just the Chinese, it was all foreigners. Anyone know what happened in 1850 that affected the miners that were not from this country? And Robin kind of, that's why you're laughing. <laughs> Anyone else want to? I was stunned when you told me that. Chinese explosion. Not, not, not yet, yet. but that does come yeah. later. Four miners. Yeah, four miners tax in 1850. It was $20 per month. So <laughs> your salary, yeah. if you were a laborer, was around a dollar a day. Wow. $20 a month is like three quarters of your whole work. If you're, but this was for miners who were mining because they wanted to prevent foreigners, mostly Chinese and Mexicans, especially. Because this was originally Mexico, but there were a lot of Mexicans that came right across and started mining right when it just became a state around that same time. Um, and then there were French miners, they're all people from all over, but the French apparently were one of the groups that formed a union and pushed back against the foreign miners tax in 1850. And then it was reinstated as a new one in 1852, $3 a month. Still not fun to pay $3 a month. And it wasn't like a very controlled system. There were like tax collectors that could come and say, you didn't give me three dollars, you gotta give me three dollars. Like, there was like a lot of that type of thing happening. Um, and so that's why the Chinese, a lot of them left mining. And then they did other work. Um, lots of work needed to happen in this country. You wanna know what kind of work they did other than mining? If there wasn't mining available without getting taxed, what was happening in this state like 175 years ago, what's going on? Railroad. Yeah. Railroads, although it was a little later. <laughs> yeah, roads. Yeah, yeah. roads. Just My roads, yeah. <laughs> roads, building roads because there wasn't a very large network of roads. Um, what else was being built or needed here? Food. Virginia City. Food, yeah. Virginia. Food was really important. So a lot of these miners came, there wasn't much Agriculture, the Central Valley was a wetland. I think read John Muir and his journey across the Central Valley to Yosemite, it was full of beautiful flowers and it's <coughs> wet. And that was the natural wetland from all the rivers. But the Chinese did an amazing amount of irrigation, um, building canals and ditches to transport the water into areas where you can grow agriculture and not be a flooded area. So the breadbasket of the world, California, many should be thinking about the Chinese who really were instrumental in that. And then in the mining towns, they were forming laundries. So they were really able to figure out a way to be successful. And they were cooks. So in this exhibit, a lot of you have seen a lot of it. Those are the main things that they did in and around Yosemite. And then they did that here in Yosemite. Um, so I have a question for all of you, and whoever wants to answer, why do you think it's really important for us to study history? Why does history matter? Anyone want to chime in, chime in, like, 
part of the history. You don't have to say the whole answer, but why is it so important to study and learn about history? Well, one reason is to not repeat mistakes. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. That's good. Yeah. Why, else? why else do we study history? create like a sense of belonging and time to a certain geography for certain people. Mm. Is history only in the past? No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's typically written by the conqueror. Mm. So everyone else gets lost in the whitewash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, another fellow ranger who just retired Federi Sostin, she that um, Rosie the Riveter, she had this, these words that really sung to me. She wrote, or she said, what gets remembered is a function of who is in the room doing the remembering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you in the room able to communicate what is remembered? Who is in the room right now? We are in the room right now. So it's like we can create and remember the histories. But in the past, it was the railroad magnets, like the Stanfords and Parkers. It was, um, you know, the business people. And they don't write in the history all the people that supported them. And I think it's important that today we're remembering a lot of the stories that were forgotten. Um, so this exhibit is an attempt to try and remember something about Yosemite's history. There were always pieces of his history clues everywhere in Yosemite. This building was a clue. The building of the road. People knew, because a lot of people a long time ago knew about this, you know, the Chinese who worked at the hotel. But I think it just, we just need to keep on telling the story so that it becomes part of history and that people will start sharing that history. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about was how does the roads in Yosemite connect to this park and the park's history? Why do you think the roads were so important for this park? Um, Yosemite Valley was one of the places where people wanted to visit, and that's where the first wagon roads were built. So the two roads that were built was one, there's a sign over here that talks about the Lawana Road. Anyone know how long it took them to build the Lawana Road? Four and a half months. Four and a half months in the winter. So from <laughs> December of 1874 to um, the winter, I mean, to the spring of 1875. And then there were two other roads before that, the Big Oak Flat Road and the Old Cultural Road that were built and finished in the summer of 1874. So those three roads were finished. And then the last road, the Tioga Road, anyone know why we built the Tioga Road? Mines. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to say? Yeah. Bennettville, yeah. So even though the gold rush was finished really fast, there were still gold discoveries. And there were definitely gold rushes and silver rushes. But it was for the gold or the silver that was expected to be coming out of near Twilling Meadows, Tioga Pass. And that road was built in 130 days. Mm -hmm. And it was, um, can you imagine, 56 miles of road, 130 days. Mm -hmm. It never was used for the mining town because the next year, the people supporting the mines took out their money and put it in other mines because they still hadn't struck the silver ledge. But I think if the Chinese hadn't built the road in 130 days, they stopped at White Wolf or they stopped at, you know, just a 10 miles instead of 56 miles, we might not have a road that accesses across the, the high country. It wasn't finished across the high country, but many years later in the early 1900s, it was built to connect to the line into the other side. That's the highest transcontinental, trans Sierra roadway. 10,000, or just under 10,000 feet. It's mining that, or, or creating the road at 10,000 feet in that amount of time. Exactly. Like, There's well, a, a picture well, here from a Chinese artist. Maybe you have artist. EIRs or an EIS. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I think these are the stories that we want to tell, and this exhibit really is a celebration of the Chinese who did so much. But, you know, more than decades of work, um, you know, we don't really have this resource, so. Yeah. I think it's really important to respect that. I'm glad you picked it on there. Yeah, that's so important. And I feel like without the community support of NPCA, now OBA and um, the Seventh and Seventh Conservancy and the donors, 
I don't think this would have happened. We really needed the momentum of the people wanting the story to be shared and told, and then really pushing the park to like, okay, we gotta protect this this history and tell the story. Oh. Anything else people found that were are grateful? That the imagery of Chinese immigrants and Chinese people in Yosemite, yeah, it looks heroic, it looks, yeah, it's different from the you know, stereotypical imagery of that day. Yeah, yeah there's like some kind of positivity, like high scene right there, it's like a pretty yeah, awesome like a, right there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mountain, mountain man. Mountain man. <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. I feel like there's a big sense of gratitude for like, like all the folks here that have made this happen because it's a very empowering lesson, how it's like, oh, you're regular folks, unearthing the story, getting folks together, sharing it, but like, you know, moving it up the chain can like make it part of the park and it makes it feel more like, oh yeah, this is this is the people's park. And like, I was here a couple months ago and I saw the flyers for like Yosemite Pride. And it's just, it's like a whole new level of feeling of like, oh, like we're welcome, we're part of a story and like, oh, we can actively be part of like changing the message also. It was really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, the question I had was in, in like the journals or whatever, is, is there just like, feeling shared about what the different Chinese workers thought about like, being in Yosemite or like yeah. just, just the place itself, I guess. Yeah, and that was my third question, but um, I will tell you, I have not found any journal writings of what it was like for the workers. And I know that like the historian Gordon Chan who writes about such the transcontinental railroad has never found an actual writing from any of those railroad workers expressing their life. So I don't know, there were a lot of, there was a lot of violence, there was actually like murders, there was like fires in Chinatown. So some of those documents may have been burned or we don't have the letters. I, I can't believe we don't have anything because letters must have been sent back to China. So I think that's where we could find those letters. But here in the US, these are like really expert Stanford historians that looked everywhere. And I found the same one. I told this history, isn't this a isn't this a document? It's like, no, that's a Canadian Chinese. So there is one, one letter. And it, I found it in this history book about this Chinese railroad worker talking and describing about how they're working, how they're putting the powder, the blasting powder, how they try to escape, and this one poor fellow hid behind a rock and unfortunately it's got um again I can't remember the history but he died from part of the blasting. And it was that first hand recollection that I remember vividly. And that's the only one that he found and the only one I saw in a book. There's no other record, which is crazy. We do have in our archives some of these people, I mean they're writing from Chinese. There's actually letters back and forth to the Sun Sun World with Sun Sun Wo. It's over there, Sun Sun Wo Mercantile Company. And, and those were like, please order for me some green mustard, like some bok choy, some pickled vegetables, and some opium or some tobacco. So th those were letters, and those were basically just very business-like orders. So we have that, which is really cool, like 1904, 1905, maybe 1902, the year, yeah. Did you want to share something you read? Yeah, well, yeah. Like, what is what? Yeah, what else is? I mean, I think you talked about being grateful, uh, grateful, and I think all you have to do is go to your home village, and you you really see what it's like, and you're really grateful for your ancestors to make the supreme effort to come here to see where you're living. Yeah. And another another story is my great great grandfather came here for gold, and he found gold. And he went back. And then I told my dad I, I was going to move to San Francisco to work. And his comment was, no worries, son. We've been separated by 2,000 miles for a long, many generations. You know. Thanks for watching EFIT Adventures as we explore the new updates to the Chinese laundry in 2023. We got to see the great Chinese calligrapher Jack Zhang as he did a performance as well as learned a little bit more of the Chinese history in Yosemite from Ranger Yan Yan Chan.
If you like more content like this, please like and subscribe and hit that bell notification for more videos. We're well on our way to a thousand subscribers, so please help us out because it greatly supports the channel. Till next time, take care and let's find your next adventure.